Tom Wiley, he's been our regional geologist since 1989. He is now officially an Oregon fossil. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, worked with the USGS from 1983 to 1989. He's got a Bachelor of Science from Humboldt University and also a Master's from Stanford University. And we thank a lot of you, Tom. Uh, we really appreciate your, your ability to communicate. And uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. I can tell you, it's, this is phase two of several phases to come. There's already other groups that are asking for uh, you know, got me guys to come and keep helping us understand what's going on. Today I'm going to review real quickly uh, some aspects of mining, particularly small mining operations, and then talk a little bit about uh, the, uh, the types of geology that we have in the area, and then I'll go on to um, what we're looking at taking the techniques we've learned to use to uh, assess mineral uh, potential on state properties. Whenever the state sells, trades, or buys a property, they, look, they attempt to figure out what the value is, and we make the first cut at that. And I'm going to try and apply that in a broad sense to Josephine County. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Then a little bit on technology transfer, the kinds of things that GAMI is doing now that we can bring to the county. Um, a little bit history on the field office, and then I'll go. So, I've got a lot of slides. Lot of slides yeah. This is, uh, you know, mineral assessment is about as boring a topic as you can get in. You guys are going to see maps that in the old days would have taken months to prepare, but now with the computer you can prepare them fairly fast. So, um, it may look like I'm ripping through stuff, but there's a lot of information here. Last time we had this meeting, the gold was at $1,600 an ounce. And these little pieces were worth quite a bit more than they are now, $400,000. Those are about two and a half inches across. And um, came out of the Greenback mine. $400,000. So I just told you about this stuff. Um, when we get to the technology and information transfer, we look at, at areas in geology, mining and historical records, uh, mine land permitting and reclamation, and a bunch of other ways you can use light on so The mining realities are there's still a lot of valuable minerals in there, but it's expensive to develop and run a mine. The mining is intensely regulated. Reclamation is required. You can't just go out and make a mess. You have to put up enough money that at the end of the process it can be cleaned up even if you go broke in the process. Working mines produce the highest resource values per acre out in the world. They also produce a lot of jobs that pay well and support other jobs in the community. Now this is a nugget. You would think California's mother load would be all played out. But this nugget was found in 1977 with a metal detector. It weighs 156 ounces. In Josephine County, we've had a couple of big nuggets. 17 pounds, about $300,000 today. Came out, that's the Collins Nugget out of uh, Althouse Creek. And a 15 pound nugget from Sucker Creek, about 260000 bucks today. This is the largest nugget that's still around from Oregon. It's the Armstrong Nugget. It's over in Baker City on display in the, in the uh, bank there. And that's where we're seeing if you go over there, go to U.S. Bank and look for a gold discovery. So the mining industry in almost all commodities is cyclical. Gold's a really good example. This chart, the red, shows the uh, inflation adjusted price of gold. So today's price of 1600 is still something less than the peak of the inflation adjusted 2500 back in the 80s. And then the black line is the, uh, the actual price. In dollars at the time. You can see when the gold, we were on the gold standard and the price was fixed down here around 35 bucks. These fluctuations go from 35 bucks in 1970, 850 in 1980, $300 in 2001, 1800 bucks a few years ago, and 1300 today. So if you're going to do a mine, you have to anticipate that 
your prices are going to fluctuate. You have to deal with that in your planning. Another part of this is there, there are things going on all the time in the economy. So there are new plays for different types of materials like natural gas. Between fracking and directional drilling, the, uh, the amount of natural gas has shot up and the price has gone down. There are also new uses that increase demand. So we're going to talk a little bit about tellurium today. Tellurium is a, a metal that's used now to make solar panels out of cadmium telluride. Sometimes the, uh, the sources, the main sources for a mineral are played out or they're put off limits politically. Um, recently China decided to embargo rare earth um, uh, exports. Wow. And so the price of rare earths shot way up. And then areas with a vibrant mining industry have to deal with these kinds of cycles. <coughs> Now, just in general, the large companies are able to seek out the large deposits, and they can deal with lower grades of those deposits. Small companies work with smaller deposits, but they generally require higher grades to make it. There are a few of these big deposits in Josephine County, including the Almeda mine. That's the picture here, down on the road. The chances are it wouldn't be accessed, accessed from the road side anymore. But if people worked on the Almeda, they'd come in from the back side. Of course, most of you in the room know there are a lot of small companies <coughs> in Canada. So there are cost factors that make or break the small mines. And a lot of us, a lot of you guys have, have small mines, and that's a big part of the county's mining economy. The, the, the predictability of the geometry and the grade of the ore material is important. If you know what you've got and you've got a lot of it, you can plan, you can spend money to be able to deal with it. If you minimize the handling of waste rock, you save money. If the ore body composition is inexpensive to process, it doesn't have anything that's going to result in acid mine drainage or something like that. It's free milling quartz, you're in good shape. Other environmentally benign materials, like if you have a lot of calcite in your mine, it's going to buffer any tendency towards acid. So sound planning and preparation are important all the way through the permitting, mine plan, and the reclamation plan. The size and orientation of the pay zone is important because you want to be able to have an efficient mine. If the veins are as wide as the tunnel and have little wall rock, you're in better shape because then you're not moving wall rock that's costing you money that doesn't have any gold. Now some places the wall rock will carry some values and that helps reduce the cost of the mine. There's a minimum tunnel width for the equipment that's available, and that's kind of what you're stuck with. So here's an ore that's inexpensive to process. It's largely free milling quartz. This one's out of the uh, 16 to 1 mine in California. We've got a lot of ores here that are similar, in, particularly in the Greenback District. And the buffering here is with uh, calcite. You get a mechanical or gravity separation of the product, so it's an inexpensive process. You don't have to roast this stuff. You don't have to, you don't have to truck it or train it someplace else to have it smelted. If you do have those types of materials, you can often concentrate your, um, your ore here and then ship just the concentrates rather than shipping all the ore. And of course, if you have to go to flotation, um, where you have the gold and the sulfides or associated with telluride minerals, um, that's a more expensive process. Now what we, what we look at in terms of, of uh, finding different kinds of prospects is what's called the play in the oil patch. And they go through a list of things that they have to have to find an oil field. So they have to have organic rich source rocks, permeable reservoir rocks, a migration path so the oil can move to the reservoir, a sealer cap on the reservoir so the oil doesn't leak out, and a trap that catches the oil in the reservoir. You can make the same kind of list of what you need to have to have a decent little mine. You can see here, with this, this is a map of Oregon, in the back there's a little light, and the distribution of, of uh, 
gold mines is shown with these dots. And you can see how many there are. There's the outline of Josephine County. You can see how many of these mines are <coughs> in Josephine County. So this is the place to look to develop a flood. So we want to find an area where there's been sufficient extension to form vein system, quartz vein system, sufficient silica in the host rock to produce the quartz that you need to make the quartz veins. And the mapping is showing this, the geologic mapping that we're making shows that where we have chert or quartzite in the area to begin with, we're more likely to develop quartz vein systems. And sufficient gold in the host racks and, or younger intrusions to be mobilized by it with the quartz and deposited in these veins. So the ideal underground mine around here would have an ore body with well-defined geometry, wider, wider than available equipment, benign or buffering gang materials, free milling product, ability to place some of the tailings underground, simultaneous mining and reclamation so that your, so that your equipment is not running empty. And if you can do all of the above, you end up with a mine that's easier to permit in the first place. Most of the small mines deviate one way or another from the ideal mine. Uh, the ore bodies are often smaller and inconsistent, so they have to deal with wall rock. The ore contains minerals like sulfides uh, that can acidify the water, and often it'll contain poisons like lead, animal, mercury, or arsenic. So you have to deal with all this then. And it costs a little bit more. Now, last time I talked a little bit about this Canadian Standard 43101, and I'm not talking about it because it's an Oregon standard. Though Gammy doesn't require this, State of Oregon doesn't require it. What I'm talking about, the reason I'm talking about this is if you guys want to describe your mind to somebody that's interested, they like to see it described in the terms that this standard requires. Um, they have the requirements for how the samples have been analyzed. Uh, they want to know, you know, how was the geologist license that, that, that uh, proofread the report? Things like that make it a lot easier to talk to somebody that's thinking about listing a mine on a Spokane or Vancouver type exchange. So if you're trying to sell your mine or, or promote a mine, this is something you should read. It's a widely accepted industry standard. And when you're working in your mines, you want to keep meaningful notes. Use a GPS to locate your sample. Focus on repeatability and use of standards in any tests that you get. Maintain your original data sets. Don't just average what you got, maintain the original. And consider doing channel and, and chip samples across whatever you think the ore body is in addition to just reporting the highest grade. So we all know that the mineral exploration business is big business. It's affected by the price fluctuations, it's affected a lot by community support, and it brings high paying jobs to them. So an example is the Benton mine. Up through April 15, 1942, when the government shut it down, it produced $500,000 in gold at 35 an ounce. That's $20 million at the current price. It's got more than two miles of underground workings, and for a while, in 1941, it was the largest payroll in the county. Some, there's some like related industries that we don't think about. Fire Mountain Gems has a lot to do with geology. They're our biggest employer right now. One of the largest firms up in Sweet Home, Oregon, is White's Metal Detectors. So there's, there are industry opportunities associated with mining and geology, in addition to the ones that you think of first. So now I'll talk about the geology a little bit. The geology of, of uh, Southwest Oregon and Northern California is, is forms what's called the Klamath Mountains. And this word terrains refers to little bits and pieces of of land and, and geology that have been brought here by the conveyor belt of, of the of plate tectonics. These things move with the ocean floor and eventually they slam into the edge of North America or into the core of the Klamath Mountains down here. And so they've just formed all these sort of parentheses shaped bands that wrap
wrap around that core. Then younger rocks are deposited on top of them and, and intruded up from beneath them. But these are the building blocks that give us the minerals that we have here in Josephine County. So when you get to under the scale of Josephine County, it's kind of this, you know, these projectors always show things a little different than they look on the screen. But here's the outline of the county, and it's just about the color of a lot of these geologic units. But what you can see in general is there's a trend, a north-northeast trend, to all these belts in the geology. And that's because these are these terrains that are wrapped around the core of the Klamath Mountain. That's just another view. We're right here. This is the Grants Pass Pluton. And so we have four or five or six terrain between, uh, between the coast and Medford. So now we get into this, this mineral scoping report or mineral assessment for Josephine County. We borrowed these techniques from the, from the state techniques, as I mentioned mentioned earlier, for state land exchange, purchase, or sale. And I, we base it on known resources, but it has to be something we have a record of. And then we look at the, how the resource distribution is related to the geology and what we can learn from the geologic setting about where there might be more or less potential for additional resources. And typically we do a review of all the minerals followed by specific well, typically we do an over, a review of all the minerals, and then I'm, but here I'm just going to talk about gold and tellurium because you don't want to hear about them more. But I will read you a list of them. So Josephine County has, in our database, about 1,600 mines and prospects shown in the dots here. And you can already see how some of these, some of these concentrations of dots line up with the geology. Aggregate mines, Sand and gravel and, and crushed rock are shown in green. Industrial minerals are shown in blue. And the metals are shown in gold. See again, the, the north-northwest trends that parallel the trends in the geology. So here's what we've got. Antimony, arsenic, asbestos, barium, beryllium, bismuth, cement, chromium, clay, cobalt. This includes limestone, these cement materials, and marble, a marble mountain. Copper, diamond, gems, gold, iridium, iron, lead, limestone, manganese, mercury, molybdenum, natural gas, maybe. There's some people looking into whether or not you can make natural gas out of something like serpentine. Nickel, palladium, platinum, rhenium, rhodium, rhodochrosite, rhodonite, sand and gravel, silica, silver, soapstone, stone crushed, dimension stone, tellurium, thallium, tin, tungsten, uranium, vanadium, and zinc. So it's quite a list. Obviously, we don't have big mines producing all of these, but we have mines or prospects where these were, have been found. First, I'll talk a little bit about aggregates since it's such a big part of the economy. Here are all the aggregate sites in the state. It's a high, right now, it's the highest value mineral product in the state. It usually occurs as thin deposits on bedrock, but the gravel deposits are as thick as 600 feet in places in the Illinois Valley. Best water well yields are often in the open gravels just above bedrock. So the sand gravel mines have to be concerned with these as well. Produce both round rock used in drainage, concrete, and landscaping, and crushed rock with uh, other uses like roadbed. Bedrock elevation, that's the top of the bedrock beneath the sand and gravel, defines what the resource is in most places. So if you have shallow bedrock, you don't have much sand and gravel. Here's the countywide distribution of aggregate mine. Well, we have in, in Josephine County uh, a kind of a unique, well, we share it with Jackson County. We have this decomposed granite because the granites here aren't, aren't uh, stable at the surface. And then we also have a lot of shale that's uh, used for roadway. The younger sands and gravels are typically higher quality. Our new geology maps show which are the younger and which are the older gravels. The provenance, that is where the gravel was originally eroded, 
tells us about the quality and distribution. Some of the, there isn't much gravel where you have a granite as a bedrock, you just get sand. Gravel derived from the shales around here is typically pretty soft. Some places the bulldozers cut right through it. You, don't, you wouldn't even know it was a gravel except there's some round quartz pebbles that survive. And the terrace gravels, the river terraces that are up off the bottom of the valley of ways, they've been around long enough that they're weathered. And so they typically don't produce the ground. The upland, gra the upland aggregate sites are, are usually um, lava flows. The new maps show a lot of these, both here in Medford. We have thick volcanic use units that are associated with what we call the Sexton Mountain Opioids, one of these terrains. And that's where rock is producing. East side of the The new maps show that there aren't nearly as many lava flows in the Applegate group. So um, there's not as much rock as you might have thought would be good for aggregate there. Here's some decomposed granite in a road pit. Because this stuff forms low hills and valleys that have a really good aquifer. You get decomposed granite where the population is growing and the population is growing where the decomposed granite is. It's all kind of symbiotic because of the good well. The industrial minerals are spread out and variable. I mentioned that we have some limestone. At one point we had the ideal cement quarry down at Marble Mountain. Uh, there have been a few attempts to produce dimension stone. One of the quarries produced the block that represents the state of Oregon in the Washington Monument. We have a lot of talc, steatite, and soapstone. Uh, we used to have a soapstone quarry over in Medford, and the operation uh, was based here in Grants Pen. And gemstones, rhodonite, clay, azil. This is the statewide distribution of industrial land. <coughs> I'm going to skip through this because we've got too many slides. This one shows the distribution. These little stars show where the, uh, this is Grant Pass, Cave Junction, little hills over here someplace. These little stars show the distribution of limestone across the countryside. That big quarry is right here, the old limestone mine that at uh, Gold Hill was right in there. Talc is shown in these little red dots, which are fairly extensive, and maybe more in Jackson than in Josephine. We've got a few in Southeast Josephine and along this fall. We don't have a lot in the way of energy resources. We don't have a lot of hope for energy resources. Um, there's a possibility we could have natural gas gas in the Dothan Formation. It's the equivalent of the Franciscan Formation in California. And there have been a couple tiny fields produced there. There's this other idea about making methane out of serpentine that's kind of interesting. And I didn't give it a lot of credence until I went on a, I led a field trip here. And one of the guys that was kind of traveling incognito and not saying too much about himself didn't remember that we went to school at Stanford together. <laughs> and I knew he went to work for Exxon. So Exxon was up here looking, sending this guy on a field trip to look at these, uh, these serpentines. So if they want to understand it, there's probably a reason. Uh, we don't have coal or coal and methane like the coast. We have some little mentions of uranium and thorium, but probably not a mine. Thorium is an interesting thing. I'll talk quite a bit more about that later. Geothermal, we only have a few warm wells. So you might find geothermal areas where it's more efficient to put in a ground source heat pump, but you're not going to make electricity. The metals, we're going to look at three, three main groups, the precious metals, the base metals, and strategic metals. This is statewide distribution of metals. And they're mainly concentrated in areas that have older rocks, like the northeast and us here in the southwest. Base metal and silver production from 1905 to 1964. This line is a million dollars. So it got up there for a while. Um, but generally it's been pretty low. Often as a um, 
byproduct of gold mining. Um, there was a mine in southern Douglas County that produced in the early 90s. The Silver Peak Mine. In copper, we have 176 mines and prospects. I'm just going to rip through these because I've got a lot of stuff. Lead, 30. Here, through here. Green Grand Pass that's right here. Cave Junction down here. Zinc, 30 mines and prospects. Because copper, lead, and zinc often occur together, a lot of these are showing the same mine. Silver, 184 mines and prospects. Of course, most of these are in concert with a gold mine. Chromium. Chromium occurs as chromite, and it's associated with the ultramatic rocks, the serpentines, and peridotite. From 1917 to 58, we produced 118,000 tons of chromite with a value of six or almost seven million dollars in, in uh, <laughs> anyway, in value of about seven million dollars. And uh, today that'd be about 23 million at 200 bucks a ton. Len Ramp, who was the, the uh, regional geologist here before I got here, did a lot of work on chromite. And he suggested that there are some, some chromite mines where they might have some fairly large reserves. He thought he was able to map out large holes that, uh, that contain the chromite. And the chromite pods are typically very hard to predict what's going on with them, where they're going to be, just find them where they are. But these may be, a, may be some bigger reserves. Nickel, we have nickel laterites associated with the weathering of the uh, peridotites and serpentine type rocks. Cobalt, same story. I'll talk about gold in a little more detail and show you how we do these resource assessments a, a, a little bit more rigorously. Uh, these are the old Oregon Exchange uh, gold pieces. This was a $10 gold piece. Uh, 1849 and the $5 gold piece. Uh, most of these were made out of, out of uh, gold brought up from California. And the Oregon Exchange Company, these initials up here, KMTAWRCS, were Kilborn, Magruder, Taylor, Abernathy, Wilson, Rector, Camel, and that. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the company. And apparently the production of these, although you know not sanctioned by the federal government, uh, did result in a much more stable price for gold. And these guys, because they didn't want to be accused of doing anything untoward, this, this was nearly 24 karat gold. And so most of these coins disappeared and were melted down so that they could be alloyed to make a, a more resistant coin. Mm -hmm. And they say that some of it, like you can see this one's kind of rounded off. They say that's happening because it was in the pocket with harder coins and just, uh, just uh, Scratching it up. So the statewide distribution of gold deposits is again in the northeast and down here with us in the southwest. This shows the, the gold production from 1877 to 1965. It's peak here in 1940. Wow, that's an interesting font. Um, the decline here is due to this issuance order L203 from 1942. And right about here in 1934, they increased the official price, and you can see our production went way up because we could get more for the gold, so more mines were productive. And economic. Josephine County through 64 produced about $325 million worth, Jackson about 265. The last 50 years, we don't know for sure, but if we just made 750 ounces per year, that's still $50 million that we added to our economy. Here's a countywide distribution of gold prospects. It shows some over in Jackson as well. You can see how they just kind of stop when you get east of Bearfield. And when you get west, uh, well, pretty much the county line over here, this is what's considered the Franciscan program. So we have 633 mines and prospects. You can see how they line up with the geology. If the green dots are the placer mines, the red dots are associated with massive sulfides, and the black dots are the other load mines. So there are places here where you'll have a bunch of load mines, and then the creeks go out across this ground that apparently doesn't contain much gold in the ground. 
Well, you guys will probably tell me different later, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, mainly, mainly plaster deposits along the rivers to get through these, these voids, but they're still there. I haven't heard there was a plaster down in here someplace west of town a couple miles. miles. Um, it isn't on our map. So I took those sites and I, and I assigned them high potential. And any ground within 500 meters of those mine sites, I, I assigned high potential. So you end up that way with about 198 square miles. It's actually a little less than that because there are a fair number of duplicates in this database. But just doing it in, that, in those rough terms, you end up with a couple hundred miles of prospective ground. Then I just kind of eyeball the concentrations of gold mines and assign those areas moderate potential. You can see that these, these match up pretty well with uh, some of the mining districts. Here's the Greenback. Uh, this would be Grants Pass and Lower Applegate, Walnut Tilma, Josephine Creek. <coughs> the uh, those moderate those areas of moderate potential about 560 square miles. The green areas still have some potential. You can see a few lines, 1380 square miles. And the blue areas, there are just a couple lines out in here, and they've already been accounted for because we we gave them a 500 meter circle in the high high potential area. So there's all three, the high potential, the moderate potential, the low potential, and the close to no potential. Another thing we look at are the mining claims. This shows the distribution of, of uh, sections within the county that have active mining claims. And so you can see there are a lot of mines out here that are not accounted for in that database. And when we do, the, uh, we, you know, decide to pursue these county assessments in this fashion, um, we're going to end up spending a lot of time on trying to understand the claim. There's the Granite Hill mine back in the day, the Greenback. And Tellurium is something that's, um, come up fairly recently and, and it's got an interesting story the way we're the way we've started looking at it and, and it occurs with gold so mine for it might pay for itself it's reported from a bunch of mines around here and it's likely more widespread than we know because the tiger eyes look like fool's gold they look like pyrite this one the silvery one in here is called calavera named for calaveras county california <coughs> So why the sudden interest? It's mainly because of this new use, this cal cadmium tellurized solar cell. It's been added to the list of strategic metals, and it adds value now to any mine where it occurs. And since it wasn't that valuable in the past, it may be present on the tailings piles and in the dumps. So the story with this is interesting, because in the early 1990s, Mike Cope brought in some concentrates from the Jewett for, for Frank Lagke and I to look at, and Frank, pulled out the reports and found the mention of tellurium. So Mike's been interested in that ever since, and he kind of pushes us to understand tellurium, and since that's supposed to be our job, we, we do a little bit. Um, then the cadmium tell telluride solar film thing went into production. They produced seven gigawatts of these, these cadmium tellurite, telluride solar panels. So in 2002, we applied for a USGS grant to study the distribution here. And, and figure out which of these <coughs> terrains, which of these geologic models is, re, is more likely to be responsible for where the tellurium is. And just lately, um, some, some Oregon State geologists, uh, John, Dr. John Dillis up there, and, and some of his students have, have confirmed the presence of tellurium in, in those old uh, Jewett mine concentrates. So we don't have many localities in the database. There's about a dozen. But I, we've, we've just recently got all our mineral reports scanned, and we ran optical character recognition on the scan. And you can just tell the thing to do it and go to lunch and come back and it's done. So, um, so we, we did that and then searched for the mineral names related to tellurium. And there's probably another couple dozen references in our reports to tellurium. Mike's probably found most of these by 
by looking at the records, but uh, this now gives us a handy tool to look for anything in our report because they're all they're all essentially a word document. How are we doing on time? Photograph or two, Okay. So, so I talked a little bit about technology transfer. What Dogami can bring to the taxpayers and the local government. We have publications, of course, and that's our main way of getting our information out. And we have digital data, like these, uh, like these databases I've been referring to all through this. And then, what what the employees really bring is the expertise. You know, to talk to somebody for a couple minutes and realize, hey, they need this, and then tell them what they need, and we can save you guys, often we can save people a lot of time not trying to chase down the wrong thing, not buy the wrong thing. Um, so let's go through a few examples of this. In terms of geology, earthquake hazards, the Cascadia subduction zone. When I first, when I first started trying to tell people about this, like, we went, we went into a place in Roseburg, and they just looked at us funny because we don't have geology. I mean, we don't have earthquakes here. And you're right. You know, we haven't felt much other than the other than the uh, Klamath Falls quakes and a couple of the quakes offshore. The research they're doing now suggests that uh, these Cascadia subduction zone quakes may happen way more often than we thought. It could be. You no, know, they used to say they happen every 500 years, and the last one was 300 years ago. We have we have good records of that because of the Japanese recorded the tsunami that hit Japan after our earthquake. Um, and you know, I thought, well, okay, it's been 300 years, and they, they happen every 500. I'm not going to freak out about it. But now they're starting to say they happen every 200. So we're 100 overdue, and that's a little different situation. Um, so we're trying to get that that word out. We recently reduced, I mean, we recently released a uh, landslide inventory for the state that's new. We've got a new geologic map of the Bear Creek area over by Medford that's on the back table if you want to look at it after the talk. Um, we have our mineral reports online. Right now we have a data preservation grant from the U.S. Geological Survey to get our big mine maps scanned and get those online. Um, those will also be available from the National Mine Map Repository, so we've got some some backup if something happens to one data set or the other. In terms of mine planning and permitting, our reclamationists have years of experience looking at mines. And, and they've studied you know, the mining techniques as well as the, as well as the reclamation techniques. And often, the mining technique that's the least expensive for the, for the uh, miner will work out to be the the mining technique that is, leads to the best reclamation. You know, I was talking earlier about you know, not running your equipment empty, that kind of thing. If they can help come up with a plan that makes the mine more efficient, you're more likely to still be in business when we want to reclaim the mine. And they're familiar with the regulatory practices and concerns of other agencies. So they can, you know, as you work through a mining plan with our guys, they can help you uh, determine whether or not the mine plan is apt to meet the specifications of other other permitting out there. <coughs> they do this you know, all through the history of mining at your site. And of course, they, we require a bond in case a miner goes broke. Nobody's ever heard of a miner that went broke. <laughs> Miners often do more than is required on these reclamation <coughs> efforts. This year we gave a, um, or, yeah, earlier this year we gave an award to Copeland for one of their mining sites down on the Applegate. And just a couple of years ago there was an award to one of the mines on the, uh, on Josephine Creek. The Williams Creek, there's a, over by Williams Creek near the, near the uh, highway, there's an old sand and gravel mine. And it was interesting to me that when OWIP first started their program to purchase properties that were most beneficial to endangered um, habitat, endangered fish, and coho, one of the first places they bought was this little gravel mine that had been reclaimed. So sometimes gravel mining is not 
the environmental problem that it might be. And if we reclaim them right, they can be a really good habitat. And, and I know a few years ago there was a book. See if I know how to undo that. A few years ago, there was, there was some exploration done down in the wild and scenic part of the Rogue River. And I don't think you can recognize that that parcel was mine today, and I'll bet most of you didn't even notice it happened. So I'm going to talk about LIDAR. This is this technique where we, we use a laser from a plane to get really um, detailed topographic information, and it also measures multiple hits of the laser, so you can measure the tops of the trees, the tops of the brush, the top of the grass, and the ground, all with one pole. So here's, here's the kind of thing, that I was talking with, with uh, Vic the other day, and he mentioned that, that he'd seen some bumpy LIDAR, and I wanted to show him today what you can really do with the forest with LIDAR. So this is a representation of what they call a point cloud. These are the points that the laser recorded. You can see it's getting the ground and this clearing down here. It's getting the different kinds of trees. And I'm convinced that most of the foresters can tell what kind of trees they're looking at, even in, in information like this. So it's real important for forest management. Now this is kind of this is kind of the higher tech end of things, and takes takes a pretty good little desktop to run this. Um, but there's some pretty simple stuff you can do that doesn't cost anything that gets you almost to this point. You can see how this would be really useful for the forest guys in determining fuel load. And in, in terms of firefighting and, and more selfishly in terms of doing geologic traverses, we've got some guys at Togami that are talking about working on tsunami evacuation studies and they're going to figure out how long it would take somebody to walk based on the LIDAR information from you know, wherever their house is to wherever their tsunami evacuation point is. Well, you can use that. If you can just, if we can set this up so that we just point at one spot on the LIDAR and point at another spot on the LIDAR and say, what's the easiest way to get there? You know, what's the fastest way a person can walk there? If it can do it for tsunami evacuation studies, maybe we can do it for firefighters and for, and for lazy geologists. <laughs> 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 In, in terms of public works, um, we were interested in some drilling that ODOT did over by the Home Depot at Medford when they were going to rebuild that on-ramp. And to show me the locations of the drill sites, they sent me a detailed contour map. I think it was like a one-foot contour. And we generated one-foot contours from the LIDAR, and they're virtually identical. So you can save the public works people might save a lot of money instead of hiring these surveys done to go ahead and, and use the LIDAR, which is already out there, already collected for, for a lot of the time. Not all of the time. You know, probably a third. Most of the areas where there are roads and where there's population. Those are those are the that's the emphasis when we collect LIDAR. I just happen to know the Hood River Road road engineer, and uh, so we're always talking about, about what he's doing with LIDAR. In terms of planning, he's been able to determine parcels where they can use a gravity connection versus a pump connection for, for a waste line. Contract implementation, the contractor didn't want to put the crown back in the road when the road was supposed to be restored to pre-existing conditions, and they just showed him the LIDAR and said, see, there's the crown. <laughs> and then in lit litigation, they were the uh, Hood River County got sued because a truck rolled over and they were, you know, the LIDAR didn't, didn't solve that issue, but it showed them exactly what the ground looked like and exactly how wide the shoulder was and that it was a pretty wide shoulder and was built to, it was wider than spec or something like that. They could prove that they have this, they have this spot um, information on what the state of the ground was like at a particular time. This is the uh, Willamette River's Corvallis, back here in the back and kind of looking southwest. Uh, you can see the modern channel of the Willamette. You can see the nesting of the younger channel, or the older channels rather. So, so here's an older channel that, that cross cuts all these older channels. 
here's a, an old gravel mine down here in this corner. This is a back channel way back over here, much older. So this kind of thing would work on the applicator on the road. In terms of flooding, this is this is a three-part look at, at uh, the revision of flood maps for Coos County. Here's the um, aerial photo of this little creek just south of Bandon. This image is a LIDAR image. See how these trees are darker down here in the air photo? See, we've, we've simply shaded the LIDAR by height above the ground to reflect that same kind of change from low vegetation to high vegetation being the darker conifer. And then this green zone, when, when they were making the first flood maps, they saw this pattern and thought it was a stream channel. And so they put that in the flood zone. But it turns out that's an irrigation ditch. So it's up high. And so the green is what we took out of the old flood, map, flood zone. And the blue is what we added in. And here's the actual stream is along this line down here. So here's the result after we did all that, but this becomes the flood map. I just want to see where the water is on the picture. On the upper left one, where's the water there? Where, where is the stream? Yeah. The stream flows right like through here. Where's well, that small? So actually, it's you know just kind of a low spot. It looks like out in the middle of this irrigated agricultural land. Thank you. So talk a little bit about the field office. We uh, mentioned like to know a little bit more about the field office. We we were established with Aaron Grant Pass in '37 with the Organic Act. Um, Governor Martin was was big locally here and pushed the establishment of the Department of Geology and Mineral Industries to help with uh, jobs during the, during the Depression. So the department administered the Grubstake Act, and we did the, the office here started out doing assays, and then it's developed a, a, a geologic library. So here's a list of the geologists that have, that have been in the office. Uh, there have been four of us since 1955. And Lynn Ramp stopped about the same time that I started. So between the two of us, we go back about 60 years. Um, and that's real handy, you know, because Lynn tells me about all these things you see out in the field and passes on the knowledge he got in his 30-some years as a geologist. And Norm Peterson, um, likewise, helped me with a bunch of mapping and passed on the information to Frank Ladke, who worked here for quite a while, and, and myself. And if you keep rolling it along that way, you don't lose a lot of this information. The community's been, been involved more than most communities are involved with most agencies. Uh, ben Bones donated land and buildings for a field office and residence up on Upper River Road back in the 60s. We co-located the office with uh, Forestry and Fish and Wildlife in, from, in 1989. Um, we maintain both the Geologic Library and the Rocky Mural Collection that's now in the courthouse. So what, what does the field office do for, for a community and for the counties in Southwest Oregon? We emphasize local issues, we understand the local issues, and we try and, and uh, look at the science in ways that will help with those issues transfer scientific information to the local community. So some of these things I've been showing with LIDAR and, and uh, information about earthquakes and that kind of stuff. Um, you get to the point where you can recognize the rocks and products from many of the mines around here. You can understand the geologic literature, and including the stuff that's, that's kind of hard to find. If someone comes in and they have a particular place they're worried about, Sometimes we can pull out something they wouldn't find at all. We do a lot of training and coordinating with other geologists working in the area. So that, and that kind of works two ways. We, we, we give them the geologic information that we have so they have a good head start. And then we, uh, we try to get them to put out 
a publication or some kind of report that's the kind of thing we will use in the communities we use. And so you don't end up with a geologist that shows up from the University of Alaska and just uh, goes away. You actually get his data incorporated in your mapping, um, all those kinds of things. It's, it makes a big difference in the types of information in the local area gets. And then when I was working down here, one of the most rewarding things was to get a, a lot of geologists working on things that I would never have time to do so that we just dramatically increased our production of geologic maps and geologic information. So we talk, everybody talked a little bit here at the start of the meeting about, about uh, what's still in the ground. Well, this piece came out of the Jamestown mine down in California in the 1990s. There's a guy standing next to it. For sure. <laughs> They found this just a few tens of feet from the old working. You know? I mean, they were really close. And we have a story that's very similar here. How many of you guys know the Miller brothers over at the horseshoe? So, so John Miller and his brother Dwight, whose name I've forgotten. Um, in the 30s, they go back into the horseshoe mine and they, and they set off a blast and they pull out all the rock and there's nothing there and they go and they have their careers and they do different things and they finally retire and they say, okay, let's go back to the mine. So they go back into the horseshoe and they start, they're getting ready for the next blast and to get ready for the next blast, they got to pry all the loose stuff up. And when they pry the loose stuff up, they find a wheelbarrow full of gold-laced rock. Wow. So, so a little bit of this is, is we don't want the county to do what the Millers did. We want them to find the resources now instead of 60 years from. Remember when I started, I showed you those two and a half inch diameter biscuits of gold? So here's a cleanup for two weeks. Oh, it didn't show up. Here, here's a cleanup for two weeks at, at the Bunker Hill mine. These are not two and a half inches across. I had the, I thought I had the little picture here of the other four, and there's like two of these are the same as those other four. So this is a massive amount of gold here. These guys produced 5,000 ounces in 1926. That'd be six and a half million dollars today. One piece so large it broke a man's leg when it fell out of the wall. <laughs> so I'll leave you. I should leave you with that to think about. <laughs> That's it. Just give me my hand. <laughs>